Chapter 161. Guzi, you are wronged. The celebratory mood from winning the championship lingered until the next morning, but the joy was somewhat diluted by the day's academic tasks. In the Slytherin common room, John found his thoughts preoccupied with the mystery of his missing wand. It was then that Malfoy approached him, a sheepish look on his face. Under John's intense gaze, Malfoy awkwardly began, John, I have something to confess. John gestured for him to continue, his curiosity piqued. Taking a deep breath, Malfoy nervously admitted, I, I lost your wand. John was momentarily stunned, a question mark practically visible above his head. You mean, you took the wand from my room? He asked, trying to piece together Malfoy's involvement with the disappearance. Malfoy fidgeted, his voice growing quieter as he explained, Remember when you asked me to walk the dog? I thought I'd bring a toy for Tom to play with, and since Tom only has one toy... His voice trailed off under John's increasingly menacing glare. We were playing, and I accidentally threw the wand out like a chew toy with a bit too much force. As Malfoy recounted the incident, John's anger was palpable. I specifically said it was in the lower drawer, he exclaimed, the truth now crystal clear. Malfoy had mistaken the real wand for a chew toy and had thrown it towards the humping willow, never to be retrieved. It dawned on John that Tom, the dog, had been unjustly blamed for the mishap. Malfoy had essentially bullied a dog incapable of defending itself. With a dangerous look in his eyes, John stared at Malfoy, who nervously attempted to lighten the mood. Considering I helped Slytherin win the championship, could you perhaps spare me? John retorted with a smirk, didn't you miss the golden snitch? Leaving Malfoy bewildered. Ultimately, Malfoy's training regimen was doubled, with Heinrich appointed to oversee it. Back in the dormitory, John observed Tom lying dejectedly in his kennel. Approaching the dog for the first time in days, John gently patted Tom's head, saying, Goozy, you've been wronged. At his master's touch, Tom's tail began to wag once more, his eyes brightening as he affectionately licked John's hand. John smiled, then glanced at the bag of dog food. You may not have taken the wand, but I haven't forgotten about the dog food incident. Tom's tail ceased its wagging and he resumed his forlorn demeanor. I'm just teasing. You're free to play, but only within the common room, John said, lifting Tom's spirits once again. Reflecting on his interactions with Sirius, John considered the complexity of their situation. Crookshanks was busy hunting mice, while Tom was merely enamored with the presence of a large black dog. John realized that, aside from providing dog food, he hadn't really assisted Sirius, who according to his own testimony under Veritaserum, had been wrongfully accused. Pondering Sirius Black's innocence and his role as Harry's godfather, John debated whether to inform Harry. However, he anticipated Ron's skepticism, especially without concrete evidence. Moreover, Ron might suspect John of conspiring with Sirius against Harry, given the loss of his pet rat, Scabbers. John was unconvinced of Peter Pettigrew's death. The notion of an animagus being easily killed by a cat seemed far-fetched. According to Sirius, Pettigrew had faked his own death before, and it was likely he had done so again. Sirius Black remains at large, and the truth about the castle is still shrouded in mystery, John mused, contemplating the implications of these revelations. After pondering the situation, John felt a wave of exhaustion wash over him. Ron, in his eyes, seemed to have an unshakable loyalty to his friends, akin to that of a steadfast rock. Currently, John found himself in an uneasy alliance with Professor Snape, who had yet to question him about how he managed to capture Sirius. This silence from Snape suggested a curiosity about how John intended to handle the situation. With this in mind, John resolved to write to Rufus Score, IMG Or. He retreated to the secret room to consume the last bottle of soul potion, which, as he had hoped, finally healed his right hand. Flexing his fingers, John grasped the quill firmly with his right hand for the first time in a while. Realizing he needed a legitimate reason to gauge Rufus Scrimger's stance, John's thoughts turned to Buckbeak. Hagrid's failed attempt to save Buckbeak in London was a minor issue, but the case's outcome could reveal much about Scrimger's character. With a newfound determination, John penned a letter, sealing it with the emblem of Johnny Silverhand. Since owls couldn't access the secret room, John made his way back to his bedroom, accidentally bumping into someone around the corner. The sudden collision nearly caused him to drop the letter. 
John Wick, are you all right? Lupin asked, his tone laced with genuine concern. John assured him he was fine, quickly pocketing the letter before continuing on his way. Lupin's smile hit a deeper, unspoken thought. As the term drew to a close, John found himself struggling with the workload. His once somewhat chubby cheeks had slimmed down, a testament to the stress and exhaustion he felt. Daphne, noticing his condition, prepared a colorful bowl of butter-fried rice for him. Despite the lack of taste, John couldn't help but compliment Daphne's effort, noting the vibrant colors she used, even if the ingredients were somewhat questionable. The Club of Stars members were all preoccupied with their studies. Percy was buried in preparation for the Newt exams, the Weasley twins were focused on the Owl exams, and Heinrich, the exchange student, seemed unfazed by the upcoming tests, confident in his abilities and the guidance he received from John. Hagrid, distressed over Buckbeck's impending execution, found solace in John's reassurances. However, John's confidence waned as he realized his letter to Scrimger had been ignored. It seemed Scrimger was not interested in compromise or respect, a realization that only fueled John's determination. In the room of requirement, John's training took on a new intensity. Wielding the silver wick sword, he moved with a precision and strength that belied his recent recovery. Whispering to himself, I am a fire dragon, he watched as the blade ignited with flames, its power amplified by the super magic crystals. This moment of empowerment marked a turning point for John, a reaffirmation of his resolve and capabilities. The training ground was instantly engulfed in a sea of flames, transforming the space into a blazing inferno. As soon as the humanoid targets came into contact with the fire, they were incinerated to ashes. Amidst the scorching flames, a dragon made of fire took form, its presence dominating the area. John, wielding a silver sword, directed the fire dragon with precision. A swift slash, illuminated by a silver glow amidst the flames, decimated the remaining targets in less than three seconds. Lowering his silver sword, John watched as the flames obliquely receded back into the blade. The once rampant fire now seemed like a tamed beast, disappearing into the sword's metal. This power surpasses that of the flame curse. Is this the strength gained from infusing it with a soul? John mused, clearly pleased with the outcome. He reflected on how he had almost missed the opportunity to become akin to a Thunderbird. His gaze then shifted to the supermagic power crystal situated at the far end of the training ground. The crystal pulsed with a vibrant purple energy, its surface marred by cracks that seemed to threaten its integrity. It still requires cautious handling, John thought to himself. The crystal had been artificially enhanced, pushing its capabilities beyond their natural limits. As a result, the super magic crystal lacked durability, and unleashing its power was akin to setting off a massive bomb in a confined space. John pondered the consequences of such an explosion, questioning whether he would be able to contain it. The transformation of the training ground into a battlefield of flames and the subsequent control exhibited by John showcased not only the raw power at his disposal, but also the delicate balance required in wielding such force. The potential for destruction was immense, a fact that John acknowledged as he contemplated the limits and responsibilities of his newfound power. Chapter 162, Rebellion and Examination The Minister of Magic, Rufus Scrimger, seemed to be showing signs of rebellion. A week before the exams, John received a letter from him, Scrimger claimed that his duties as minister had kept him from responding sooner. John couldn't help but sneer at this excuse. It was clear to him that Scrimger was trying to assert his independence now that he was in office, suggesting that he was too busy with official matters to be concerned with anything else. The underlying message was clear. He was now untouchable, even by the likes of Merlin or Buckbeak. John didn't bother replying. Instead, he stored the letter away, his expression unreadable. If Scrimger wanted to assert his independence, John would let him. Meanwhile, John redoubled his efforts to locate Peter Pettigrew, keeping the Marauder's map active around the clock in hopes of capturing him. Trying to lighten his mood, John tossed a stick for Tom to fetch and sat on the lawn, enjoying a moment of leisure. Daphne, busy with her own studies, hadn't had time to cook, sparing John from her culinary experiments. With exams approaching, 
classes had lightened their workload, giving students ample time to review. John fiddled with a badge in his hand, recalling how he had used it to contact Professor Snape. The badge was a means of communication within the Quunxing Club, a student organization John had no intention of hiding. However, Snape, clearly disinterested, had removed his badge in disdain. It was obvious to John that no professor, especially one loyal to Dumbledore like Snape, would join a student club. The ninth badge remained unassigned. John wondered if Snape would inform Dumbledore about Sirius's confinement in the Forbidden Forest, a place John visited occasionally. Sirius, for his part, had been relatively well-behaved, finding the forest a paradise compared to Azkaban. Hagrid and Hermione were busy with their efforts to save Buckbeck, Hermione somehow finding the time to gather information despite the impending exams. John marveled at her dedication, knowing she would usually be buried in her studies. The library was crowded with students reviewing for exams, leaving only a few seats available. John, there to return some overdue books, noticed Mrs. Pince's surprise at the number of restricted books he had borrowed. With the books returned, John focused on preparing for the exams. A week passed, and the day of the exams arrived. The first exam was Transfiguration, where John successfully transformed a teapot into a turtle under Professor McGonagall's supervision. She praised his work, and John moved on to his next exams in Arithmancy and Divination, subjects overseen by Professor Vector. It was John's first encounter with the professor, who was curious about the student who had been absent for a year. The exams went smoothly, and by lunchtime, John was ready for a simple meal of bread and water, while Daphne took his place in the ongoing preparations and studies. John reluctantly finished his plate of mango pasta, a dish that could only be described as mediocre at best. Transfiguration this morning was incredibly difficult, Malfoy grumbled, his expression sour. Transfiguration was not his forte. John glanced at Daphne, who had been listening. With her excellent grades and proficiency in transfiguration, she seemed unfazed by the challenge. In the afternoon, it was time for the spell test. Professor Flitwick looked at John with an expectant gaze as if hoping for a remarkable improvement in the happy charm. John's partner for the test was Goyle, who let out a laugh, leaving John on the verge of tears. Mr. Wick, your execution of the happy charm was excellent. Goyle, you still need to practice, at least until you don't accidentally turn the happy charm into a sad charm, Professor Flitwick commented. Despite clearly failing the exam, Goyle emerged with a bright smile, mistakenly believing he had performed well. After the charms exam, John proceeded to his ancient runes test, a subject he found remarkably ease. Why? Professor Bathshada Babbling was taken aback by John's performance, her expression one of disbelief at the ease with which he answered the questions. For John, who was exceptionally skilled in runes, teaching the subject seemed like a plausible future endeavor. John concluded his first day of exams, feeling more relaxed than nervous, performing at his usual level of competence. At dinner, Daphne mentioned the difficulty of the day's topics, though her expression betrayed a confidence that suggested she was among the top performers. Malfoy, on the other hand, appeared despondent, facing the prospect of additional training as punishment for concealing the loss of his wand. He was required to practice three times more than usual until the end of the term. The next day brought an unexpected task from Hagrid. Despite extensive lessons on fantastic beasts, the students were assigned to care for flobberworms with the simple goal of keeping them alive for an hour. John couldn't help but think Hagrid was taking it a bit too easy. After all, flobberworms required minimal attention to survive. This task seemed like a brief respite in a week filled with rigorous exams. John observed Hagrid engaging in lighthearted conversation with a few students while they checked on the flobberworm's well-being. In the afternoon, the atmosphere tensed again for the potion test, filled with the sounds of distress. Malfoy, however, seemed in his element, smugly observing the struggling Gryffindors. The task was to brew a confusion potion, a concoction designed to disorient its consumer. The main challenge lay in achieving the correct thickness of the potion, a task that John found surprisingly straightforward. He was the first to complete the potion and submit it to Professor Snape for evaluation. Snape, maintaining his usual stoic demeanor, awarded John a perfect score. 
Glancing at Harry, who appeared perplexed, John contemplated offering a hint but decided against it, respecting Harry's journey as the chosen one. The evening brought astronomy classes atop the tallest tower, a location not far from the divination classroom. The third day of exams began with the history of magic, a subject so dull that John wondered if Professor Binns possessed the ability to hypnotize. The exam, focusing on witch hunts in the Middle Ages, was as tedious as the lectures. The sweltering classroom made students yearn for a refreshing bite of nut ice cream as they diligently scribbled their answers on parchment. Professor Binns collected the papers with his usual lack of enthusiasm, unaffected by the oppressive heat. The heat persisted into the afternoon's herbology exam. The greenhouse under the relentless sun became stifling, causing a Slytherin student to nearly faint. Once the exam concluded, everyone eagerly escaped the greenhouse in search of cooler surroundings. Thursday marked the last day of exams. Professor Lupin, a favorite among the students, had devised the most enjoyable test, an outdoor obstacle course. John navigated through the challenges, including crossing a deep pond, with a mix of determination and skill, showcasing his adaptability and quick thinking. In the magical creature's habitat, John's presence was enough to instill fear in the hearts of the creatures lurking within. Grindelows, hiding in their murky waters, were swiftly scared off by his mere threat. The potholes, usually bustling with red caps, were eerily silent, as not a single one dared to emerge in his presence. The hinky punk, found in the swamp, had curled itself into a ball, hoping to go unnoticed by John. Lastly, an old box harboring a boggard was cleverly dealt with by transforming the creature into chocolate rice rolls before being securely locked away again. John humorously warned the boggard to get out of China with your chocolate rice rolls, showcasing his unique approach to handling magical creatures. The final two exams, divination and muggle studies, were up next. John breezed through divination without the need for any predictions, securing full marks effort. Leslie, the sensation of having an unfair advantage was strangely exhilarating. Professor Trelawney, before he left, ominously mentioned that the prophecy he had made at the beginning of the school year was nearing its fulfillment. This revelation momentarily stunned John as he pondered the implications of his earlier prophecy. Muggle studies concluded with a simple question about the purpose of a rubber duck, which John answered without difficulty. As he exited the examination room, an owl landed on his arm, delivering a letter from Hagrid. The letter bore bad news. Buckbeak's appeal had failed. John immediately understood that Rufus Scrimger had a hand in this decision. Despite John's efforts to persuade a Slytherin classmate to withdraw the complaint against Buckbeak, Scrimger's determination prevailed. It seemed Scrimger was using Buckbeak's situation to test John to gauge his reactions and decisions moving forward. John couldn't help but sneer at the calculated move. Hey, it's a clever scheme. I suppose he thinks Johnny Silverhand won't turn hostile over a hippogriff, he mused. In his view, the situation wasn't personally painful, but it was undeniably irritating. John's handling of magical creatures, his effortless success in exams, and his reaction to Buckbeak's failed appeal painted a picture of a student who was not only powerful and intelligent, but also deeply connected to the creatures and people around him. His interactions with the magical world around him were marked by a blend of humor, cleverness, and a readiness to confront challenges head-on, even when faced with the machinations of figures like Rufus Scrimger. Chapter 163, Execution and Ticking Rufus Scrimger was in a state of urgency, having dispatched additional Dementors to Hogwarts. Since assuming his role, he had promised to abandon mere rhetoric. Yet nearly half a year had passed without any sign of Sirius Black. The disappearance of a dozen Dementors, attributed to Sirius, only added to the Ministry of Magic's embarrassment. Now, capturing Sirius seemed the only way to remove the interim, label from his title, and restore the Ministry's credibility. John encountered a grim-faced scrimger within the castle walls, clearly in a foul mood. Scrimger's arrival, flanked by witnesses and executioners from the Committee for the Disposal of Dangerous Creatures, was a significant event. For a man of Scrimger's background, an Auror known for his toughness, being involved in such a matter seemed beneath him. It was evident he had a specific agenda in mind. 
I wonder if Johnny's silver hand is deemed unreliable, prompting him to seek a new ally? John mused, watching Scrimger head towards the headmaster's office for a discussion. It's a shame. As Minister of Magic, one might wield significant influence. But Scrimger, still only the interim minister, has yet to win Dumbledore's approval. The execution at sunset? Buckbeak has become a pawn in their game, John thought, recalling Hagrid's letter. He felt a pang of sympathy for Hagrid. Time to seek solace, John sighed, making his way to the Society of Stars' secret chamber. With the holidays approaching, there were matters within the chamber that required his attention. Upon reaching the fourth floor, John inspected the enchantments he had left in place. Although others had entered the vicinity, they remained oblivious to the secret door's magic, which didn't concern John at the moment. Inside, he found the firebolt, meticulously maintained and returned to its rightful spot, clearly Malfoy's handiwork. John then proceeded to the armory's secret passage, summoning the silver wick sword. Noticing an additional crack in the super magic crystal, he completed his inspection and glanced at the new shoes on the table before putting them on. His attention then turned to the ring of spells. The ring, now as black as ink, with its gem completely darkened, resembled an abyss. The soul-devouring curse must be used sparingly, he reminded himself, observing a tiny crack in the ring. A ring, after all, was not designed to contain immense magical power and could break under the strain, just as the magic power crystal had. John packed the Heart of Silence and the newly crafted Ring of Spells into a small bag. These items were not casually sold at Johnny Silverhand's store. Customers were carefully vetted before purchase. Of course, some dark wizards managed to acquire them. Nocturnally thrived on such gray market dealings, albeit at a steep price. The bag, enchanted with the no-trace stretching charm, did not reduce the weight of its contents. However, an alchemical product from Nicholas Flamel it was also enchanted with a floating charm, keeping it perpetually light. Originally intended for Madame LeMay, it had been gifted to John as the couple departed this world. With everything packed, including ten magic crystals, five from the Chamber of Secrets, and five crafted by John himself, he made his way to dinner, arriving on time for once. Upon entering, he noticed Malfoy, fresh from exams, boasting with an air of nonchalance. It was a performance designed to impress, suggesting everything was effortlessly within his grasp. John quietly observed, taking a seat to watch Malfoy's carade unfold. Perhaps sensing John's scrutinizing gaze, Malfoy settled down with an awkward smile, barely managing to sit before John's unyielding stare. John remarked, Is your training task complete? As he observed Malfoy, whose expression was one of surprise, seemingly unprepared for the final exam's practice. Upon locking eyes with John, Malfoy quickly responded, I'll go right away, and dashed off, followed closely by Goyle and Crab, who were hastily crammed bread into their mouths before leaving. Daphne was taken aback by John's punctuality at mealtime and his lack of preparation for his own meal. As she moved to demonstrate her culinary skills, John, in a panic, stuffed his mouth with bread, claiming he was full. He noticed the trio had finished their meal, their faces etched with concern as they discussed Hagrid and decided to leave. Unbeknownst to them, John followed closely behind. Passing a broom cupboard, John paused, puzzled. Who would be so bold, he mused, finding the choice of location for a date peculiar. Shaking his head, he moved on. Moments later, the cupboard emitted two sighs of relief, with a boy's voice questioning if they had been seen, and a girl's voice responding uncertainly. Outside Hagrid's hut, John noticed the interim minister of magic, Rufus Scrimger, descending the stairs with a stern look, flanked by two members of the Dangerous Animals Committee. This delayed John slightly. Upon arrival, he saw Buckbeak in the pumpkin patch and deduced that Harry and the others were inside, comforting Hagrid. Hearing Jars break inside, he sensed Hagrid's distress. Approaching Buckbeak, John bowed, receiving a bow in return. He contemplated freeing Buckbeak, but decided against it to avoid implicating Hagrid. Go in peace, he whispered, patting Buckbeak before turning to leave, choosing not to intrude on Hagrid's sorrow. As he turned away, John paused, drawn to the woods behind the pumpkin patch. His keen eyes detected movement, prompting him to investigate. However, the presence in the woods retreated. John, now curious, considered exploring further. Suddenly, 
the quiet was broken by distant voices. Checking his pocket watch, John noted the time and observed the setting sun over the forbidden forest. A group, including the Dangerous Animals Committee, Scrimger and Dumbledore, approached from the castle. Realizing he couldn't conceal the truth from Dumbledore, John decided to leave. Shortly after, Harry, Hermione, and another emerged from Hagrid's hut under an invisibility cloak. In the woods, Harry and Hermione, both sporting hemostatic stickers, were puzzled by John's perceptiveness. Hermione, with a glint in her eye and an hourglass pendant around her neck, hinted at a plan, recalling Dumbledore's words. Harry was taken aback. What had Dumbledore meant? Seeing his puzzled expression, Hermione, with the sternness of a concerned mother, reminded him, If everything goes well, you can save more than one innocent life tonight. Should you face any obstacles, don't hesitate to seek help. She took a deep breath before adding, We need help, Harry. Meanwhile, in Hagrid's hut, a grim scene was unfolding. The Committee for the Disposal of Dangerous Creatures had convened to deliver Buckbeak the Hippogriff's death sentence. The Committee has ruled that Buckbeak, herein referred to as the creature, is to be executed at sunset on June 6th. The decree continued, detailing the manner of execution, sentenced to be beheaded, with Walton McNeil, the executioner appointed by the Members' Association, to carry out the sentence. Scrimger wore a somber expression, contrasting sharply with Dumbledore's enthusiastic demeanor. Dumbledore seemed unfazed, engaging Scrimger as if their earlier disagreement in the headmaster's office had never occurred. Unbeknownst to them, as the sentence was being read, a figure stealthily approached from the woods, making their way into the pumpkin patch. Upon seeing the newcomer, Buckbeak bowed gracefully, a sign of respect among hippogriffs. The figure bowed in return, acknowledging the creature's gesture. It was a silent exchange of trust and understanding. Buckbeak, let's go, Harry called out, seizing the moment of distraction. His voice was firm, filled with a mix of urgency and hope. The plan was set into motion, a daring rescue under the fading light of the setting sun. Chapter 164, Ice Lake and Fire Sword. John was on his way to see Sirius, a matter of great importance. The weather was agreeable, suggesting a clear night ahead. However, upon arriving at Sirius's holding place, an unsettling silence greeted him. Normally, Sirius would express his displeasure with loud howls, but today, there was nothing. A sense of dread washed over John as he approached the door, only to find the room empty, save for a pile of dirt in the corner. His face fell as he spotted a hole leading outside. Have you become an expert at digging tunnels now? He muttered under his breath. The hole, nearly ten meters thick, was a clear sign. Sirius had escaped. Realizing the gravity of the situation, especially considering Sirius's potential leverage against the Ministry of Magic with Veritaserum, John wasted no time and hurried out in search of him. Meanwhile, from Harry's perspective, using the time-turner, chaos ensued. Where is the monster? demanded the commissioner, his voice piercing through the air. But it was too late. Buckbeak had already been rescued by Harry and Hermione. Hagrid's tears of joy were a stark contrast to the commissioner's frustration. Dumbledore, with a knowing smile, invited Rufus Scrimger for tea, subtly celebrating the small victory. Harry and Hermione, having secured Buckbeak, positioned themselves near the Whomping Willow, waiting for what was to come. Soon, they spotted Ron chasing after Scabbers, or rather, Peter Pettigrew. Harry's gaze hardened at the sight of the man who betrayed his parents, fighting the urge to act rashly, a sentiment Hermione quickly echoed. This moment followed the trio's departure from Hagrid's cabin, with Crookshank's frightening scabbers into the open. Harry admitted to resenting the cat at first, but now he wished Crookshank's had been quicker. Ron, stepping out of the cloak's protection, seemed to materialize out of nowhere, with Harry and Hermione following suit. The sudden appearance startled Ron, causing a commotion that drew Sirius's attention. Sirius, in his animagus form of a large black dog, focused intently on Scabbers. With swift movement, he pounced, causing Ron to cry out as Sirius bit down on his leg. The sound of bone cracking echoed ominously. In a desperate attempt to save Ron, one of them kicked Sirius, eliciting a pained groan from the dog. However, Sirius remained undeterred, dragging Ron into the secret passage beneath the Homping Willow, which retaliated against the intrusion. The pain from the tree's assault was still fresh in Harry's mind, 
a terrifying reminder of their perilous situation. Inside the Homping Willow, Crookshanks proved to be an unexpected ally, helping them navigate the tree's defenses. As they waited for the next development, Snape's arrival, cloak in hand and aware of the tree's secret, prompted a smirk from Harry. Hermione, is John the helper you mentioned? Harry inquired, his curiosity piqued. Hermione confirmed, adding that John was unaware of their situation, but was crucial to their plans. The question of how to find John, now that he was missing, hung in the air. Harry, reflecting on a later encounter with a Dementor, shared his awe at witnessing a powerful Patronus chase the creatures away, a moment that left him wondering about the identity of the caster. Lost in thought, Hermione said, Could it be John? As far as I know, the only ones capable of conjuring a Patronus are him and Professor Lupin. Hermione immediately thought of John, recalling how he had chased away the Dementors that had swarmed the Quidditch pitch. She had previously harbored doubts about whether John was aiding Sirius. In the Shrieking Shack, Sirius, despite his bruised face, insisted that John hadn't helped him, but had instead captured him and locked him away. Hermione felt a pang of guilt for having suspected her friend. While they were discussing this, Hagrid emerged, beaming with joy and holding an empty glass. Harry had always believed it was his father who had conjured the Patronus. At this moment, Hermione chose not to correct him, especially since they were about to leave. Buckbeak, sensing the tension, became restless and pecked at Harry's hand, causing him to yelp in pain and release the creature, which then ran into the woods. Harry made to chase after it, but Hermione held him back. Emerging from the secret passage beneath the Whomping Willow, Lupin appeared first, followed by Pettigrew in human form, Ron, Sirius, and then Hermione. Harry nearly bolted out to confront them, but was restrained by Hermione. What if Pettigrew escapes again? Harry asked, frustration evident in his voice. Hermione understood the difficulty of capturing Pettigrew in the dark, and stressed that their priority was to save the others. Harry, though reluctantly, agreed. The moon then emerged from behind the clouds, catching Lupin off guard. It was too late. The full moon had risen. Lupin's transformation into a werewolf began, his limbs seizing as panic ensued beneath the humping willow. Harry again attempted to rush out, but Hermione held him back, her patience wearing thin. Sirius transformed into his animagus form, a large dog, and lunged at the werewolf Lupin in an attempt to buy time for the others to escape. Unnoticed in the chaos, Pettigrew seized Lupin's wand, casting a spell on Ron before transforming into a mouse and fleeing. From a distance, Harry and Hermione anxiously watched as Lupin, now fully transformed, chased after Sirius. The sounds of wolves howling and dogs barking filled the air until they merged into a single, eerie howl. In a desperate attempt to distract Lupin, Hermione mimicked a wolf's howl. The werewolf paused, confused by the sound. Lupin, now a werewolf, seemed almost to want to correct the grammatical errors in the howl, but was soon distracted by other concerns. Harry and Hermione fled in terror as Lupin turned his attention towards them. Suddenly, the forest was filled with the ominous sight of Dementors swarming through the trees. In a dramatic turn, Buckbeak reappeared, bravely confronting Lupin and managing to drive the werewolf away. There's no time to waste, Hermione urged, pulling Harry along as they ran towards the lake. The moonlight was dimmed by the sheer number of Dementors gathering above them. Harry, desperate to see his father's Patronus, which he believed had saved them before, was met with disappointment. Realizing that no one else would come to their aid, Harry knew it was up to him. Standing at the edge of the lake, Harry raised his wand and shouted, Expecto Patronum! A brilliant silver stag erupted from his wand, charging into the mass of Dementors and scattering them. This moment mirrored the one Harry had witnessed just before losing consciousness earlier. Overwhelmed by the realization that it was he, not his father, who had conjured the Patronum, Harry was filled with a complex mix of emotions. Hermione screamed, Harry! Snapping back to reality, Harry saw the sky darkened by a swarm of Dementors. Despite the strength of his stag Patronus, it was struggling against the sheer number. Panic surged through both him and Hermione as they watched a Dementor fly menacingly towards Sirius, its intent clear, to suck out his soul. More Dementors were closing in on them, and Harry desperately maneuvered his Patronus to fend them off. 
In a moment of desperation, Hermione thought of a plan. Clenching her teeth, she extended her wand, aimed it skyward, and cast it with all her might. Lumos Maxima, a ball of light shot from her wand, soaring into the sky before exploding into a brilliant burst of light. Hermione, what are you doing? The Patronus charm is what works on Dementors, not light spells. Harry yelled, thinking she was confused. Ignoring him, Hermione kept her eyes fixed on the sky, whispering a prayer under her breath. John, you must see this. The number of Dementors had grown to over a hundred, a daunting force that threatened to overwhelm them. Just as their situation seemed dire, a glimmer of silver cut through the darkness. An albatross, majestic and swift, sliced through the brave Dementors, clearing a path. John, Hermione gasped in astonishment. Following the albatross, a streak of light descended rapidly from the sky, plunging into the center of the lake. The impact sent waves crashing against the shore. In the heart of the turmoil, a sword emerged, its hilt grasped by a hand adorned with slender fingers and well-defined knuckles. Silver and black rings encircled the middle and ring fingers, engraved with symbols that seemed to whisper in ancient or perhaps draconic tongues. I am a fire dragon, a voice declared. The silver sword burst into flames, its purple crystal core pulsing with magical energy. With a flourish, the flames transformed into a dragon, its wings spreading wide, melting the ice on the lake and forcing the Dementors to retreat. Harry and Hermione watched, spellbound, as the mysterious figure made a dramatic entrance. Descending from the heavens, he stepped onto the lake's surface, a fire dragon coiling around him. The sword in his hand blazed fiercely, a beacon of hope in the dark night. Chapter 165 Fragmentation and the Dark Tide How did John discover Harry and the others were in trouble? It's quite a tale, so let's condense it. After escaping the spider's lair, John was alerted by the howling of wolves. Investigating the source, he encountered a werewolf. Just as the werewolf prepared to attack, Buckbeak, who was miraculously alive, intervened. Strike, but harm not those who show respect, Buckbeak seemed to declare, fending off the werewolf with a powerful swipe of its paw, sending the creature fleeing without John needing to fire a single shot. Puzzled by Buckbeak's unexpected survival, John's attention was soon captured by Dementors swarming the skies. A flare shot into the air, its brilliance impossible to ignore. Riding Buckbeak, John flew towards the source, initially curious about the identity of the signaler. However, as the Dementors converged on Hermione, John's hesitation vanished and he drew his sword. After all, what kind of knight would he be without his sword, especially with such a noble steed beneath him? Thus, a dramatic descent from the heavens ensued. Ding, challenge task triggered, expel the Dementor, receive plus two to any stat. If you're going to be this picky, don't expect any blessings, John muttered, stepping onto the lake's shore with his new shoes, looking skyward with a mix of annoyance and resignation. The system this school year was proving to be quite the challenge, offering little beyond the standard Hogwarts tasks and the quest to maintain top rank. And now, a challenge task without any reward? The system's generosity was waning. John refocused on the battle. Fire spells could only make the Dementors flinch. They did little actual damage. It seemed as if Rufus Scrimger had unleashed all of Azkaban's Dementors upon them. Glancing around, John spotted two bodies by the bank and nearby, Harry and Hermione. Confusion struck him. Wasn't Harry lying there? Could there be a double? The situation was perplexing, but the immediate threat of the Dementors demanded John's full attention. He summoned his Patronus, a majestic albatross, to fend off the dark creatures. As Harry's stag Patronus faded, he watched in awe as John made a dramatic entrance. John, be careful, Hermione shouted, spotting a Dementor closing in on him. The albatross Patronus swiftly dispatched the threat. However, the Dementors, undeterred, shifted their focus to Sirius. John, seeing the danger, intervened with his Patronus, protecting both Sirius and Harry, whose true identity he still questioned. As the Dementors turned their attention back to John, Hermione and Harry prepared to counterattack. But Harry's strength was waning. The sheer number of Dementors was overwhelming. Landing by the lake, John found himself surrounded. Recognized by some of the Dementors, they attempted to drain his soul. Unwilling to hold back, John unleashed the Soul Eater curse. Black silk threads sprang from the ring on his finger, ensnaring an approaching Dementor and eliciting a chilling scream. 
The Dementors, recognizing the threat, attempted to destroy John, fearing the power he wielded. One by one, the Dementors were bound and devoured by the curse. Hermione watched in disbelief as the dark creatures were subdued by the black threads. John, like a dark weaver, spun the threads into a tangled web of curses. Souls hovered nearby, but John had no time to dwell on them. Suddenly, a crisp crack echoed. John's expression turned to horror as he noticed the widening crack on his black ring. In the next moment, the ring was covered in fractures. As the curse's power grew, the ring could no longer contain it, threatening to unleash an uncontrollable force. The ring shattered and exploded, its fragments scattering in all directions. Amidst the chaos, the black gem continued its relentless absorption. John sensed the impending danger as the silver ring morphed into a hand, seizing the black gemstone with an iron grip. The six magical power crystals were operating at their maximum capacity, their surging energies forming a cage in a desperate attempt to contain the curse. With the original container destroyed, John had no choice but to transfer the curse into the limited gauntlet temporarily. On the gauntlet, black tendrils resembling thin nerves sprouted, weaving a complex pattern. The curse, now unbound, surged from his palms uncontrollably. Damn it, not now, John cursed under his breath, as he intensified the power of his magical gauntlet in an effort to contain the curse. The six crystals glowed with a deep purple hue, signaling their struggle against the unexpected turn of events. The curse seemed to possess a will of its own, its violent fluctuations beyond control. The Dementors, sensing the turmoil, ceased their assault and fled. The black tendrils lashed out, tearing through their ethereal forms. Terrified, the Dementors soared towards the sky, seeking escape. Despite their efforts, nearly twenty were consumed by the curse. Great! Hermione exclaimed, her voice tinged with surprise. Noticing John's focus, she urged, John, we need to go. John remained steadfast, aware that time was of the essence. Hermione, growing anxious, knew they could not afford any delays if they were to save Sirius. She reached out to John, but he rebuked her sharply. Get out of here! Hermione hesitated, and in that moment, the black tendrils from John's hand shot towards her. She dodged swiftly, but the time-turner was struck, a crack forming on its surface. Sand began to leak from the hourglass, and John felt a disorienting sense of displacement, as if being torn from the fabric of time and space. Without a second thought, John grasped the time-turner, removing it from around his neck. Holding the time-turner in one hand and the Soul Eater in the other, he said grimly, Leave quickly. I'll handle this. Hermione, usually composed, found herself at a loss. Harry, sensing the urgency, took charge. Hermione, listen to John, he said, pulling her away. Harry's resolve did not waver, even in the face of danger. He knew John would be all right having seen him return safely to the school hospital before. Dumbledore's instructions to find John further reassured him that John would emerge unscathed. As they made their escape, Harry spotted someone emerging from the bushes. He knew they couldn't risk being seen together, so he hurried Hermione away with a mix of urgency and determination. Once alone, John could finally focus on the task at hand. The sensation of being peeled away from reality intensified as the sand from the time-turner melded with his being. The world around him flickered between day and night, a clear sign of time magic at work. John found himself in the midst of a flashback, witnessing a scene of a dark-haired boy being bullied by his peers. A girl intervened, only to be rebuffed by the boy, leaving the scene in sadness. John couldn't dwell on the familiarity of the boy, as the pull of time magic whisked him away to another memory. This time, a handsome boy confronted Hagrid, expressing his concern for the school's safety. The scene shifted once more, revealing the same boy, now with a look of greed and longing as he caressed an ancient book. Caught in the whirlwind of time and soul magic, John realized the gravity of wielding two of the most forbidden powers in the magical world. In his gaze, the cover of the book bore the title Secrets of Cutting-Edge Black Magic. As he continued to observe, his vision shifted to a classroom where a male professor was teaching defense against the dark arts. The lesson on boggarts was underway, and the class erupted into laughter when a freckled boy's boggart transformed into a desk. The teacher chuckled along with his students but suddenly paused and turned around. His eyes met John's. 
The professor seemed to want to say more, but before he could, John was pulled away once again. This time, John found himself beside the lake, narrowly avoiding a tumble with a heap of snapping kelp. The experience was disorienting, but brief. It felt as though he was trapped in an endless vortex, with the S, all eater curse weaving its way through the time turner, slipping between his fingertips. John realized with a sinking feeling that escape was impossible. I need a powerful spell, something strong enough to break this cycle, he thought. However, John knew he lacked the magical strength required. His gaze then fell upon a silver sword nearby, which, due to its proximity, had also been caught in the temporal chaos. With a determined expression, John prepared for what might be his final act. Fred, he heard George's voice call out after another temporal leap amidst a cacophony of other sounds. Fred's attention was drawn to a wall that had just exploded. Perhaps it was the adrenaline or the clarity that comes with facing one's end, but his vision sharpened. Debris flew towards him, carrying a deadly curse. Was this how he would die? In that critical moment, he spotted an unexpected figure. John? Fred uttered in disbelief. Without hesitation, John released his grip. The Soul Eater curse, no longer contained, swiftly enveloped the hourglass. In a matter of seconds, it consumed the hourglass and morphed into a ghastly human face. Without a second thought, John seized the silver wick sword. Gripping it with both hands, he thrust it into the spectral face with all his might. The moment the sword made contact, all the magical energy suppressed within the super magic crystal was unleashed. The crystal shattered, and the sword's blade cracked, scattering silver fragments. Centered on John, a massive wave of magical energy burst forth in hues of purple, black, white, and gold, radiating outward in a spectacular explosion. Had it not been for the temporal force field, the blast could have engulfed the entire castle. John, standing before Fred, was consumed by the explosion and vanished from sight. The curse that had been hurtling towards Fred was obliterated by the force of the blast, and he was merely knocked back by the residual magic. Chapter 166, Time's Chasm and the Gate of Eternity. Time halted. Voices vanished. Space plunged into darkness. Suddenly a crack materialized out of nowhere, wide enough for only one person to pass through. John, holding the remnants of the silver wick sword, which was now reduced to a third of its original size, observed as the super magic crystal that once adorned its hilt had vanished, leaving behind a majestic purple hue created by magical power. Taking a step forward, John pondered the aftermath of the massive explosion he had survived. He had expected to be severely injured, yet it seemed the magic had spared him from the worst. The magic crystal embedded in his gauntlet was destroyed, and as he tentatively inserted the silver wick sword into the crack, it disappeared without a trace. It was as if the sword had never existed. Trapped in this unchanging space, John realized his only option was to move forward or remain lost forever. Taking a deep breath, John tightly gripped his wand. He noticed a golden mark beneath the skin of his left hand, indelible and mysterious, contrasting with a black mark on his other hand. With no other choice, he stepped towards the crack. Beyond the crack lay an expanse of nothingness, devoid of any sense of direction, with countless shattered mirrors scattered in every direction. If the misty illusion was akin to minimalist art, this place was its complex and ornate counterpart. Walking on the mirrors produced a creaking sound, yet they held firm under John's weight. Without any indication of an exit, John had no choice but to press on, realizing his sword was nowhere to be found. Could it have ended up somewhere else, he wondered, choosing a direction to explore. After an indeterminate amount of time, John encountered a mirror. Upon touching it, the reflection shifted, revealing a disheveled man feverishly adding ingredients to a cauldron. His face twisted in madness, he severed his own hand in a fit of rage after an insult from his wife, who fled in terror. Undeterred, the man continued his alchemical pursuits for ten years, dying without achieving his desired result. John, intrigued, touched another mirror. This one showed a different alchemist, one who led a seemingly perfect life filled with love and kindness. Yet, this man too was consumed by his secret alchemical endeavors, ultimately dying alone in his hidden laboratory. Mirror after mirror, John witnessed the lives of countless alchemists, each driven by an insatiable quest, regardless of their fortunes or miseries. 
Suddenly, a mirror revealed not a reflection, but a man looking directly at John with a knowing half-smile. John Wick, I'm glad you've arrived, the figure spoke, stepping out of the mirror. He was adorned in feathers, resembling a large white bird, and appeared to be in his twenties, holding an oak cane. You know me? John asked, wary of the stranger. The man smiled warmly. Of course I know you. I know all alchemists, but you are the most unique among them. You've reached this place in the blink of an eye. Shining? John queried, puzzled yet intrigued by the mysterious figure's knowledge and the enigmatic realm he had stumbled into. John followed the mysterious figure, just his mind racing with the implications of their conversation. Time seems to jump erratically here. The last visitor I saw has long since turned to dust, and yet you stand before me, the figure remarked, his eyes shimmering with a pink hue that seemed to pierce into John's very soul. They stopped before a door that appeared quite ordinary, yet it felt both in harmony and out of place within the peculiar space they occupied. The man turned to John, offering a smile that held centuries of secrets. You are among the rare few who have found their way here over the years. You may call me Alchemist Zero, and this, he gestured towards the door with a gravity that belied its simple appearance, is known as the Gate of Things. Only those who have mastered the pinnacle of alchemy can hope to cross its threshold. John examined the door, finding nothing remarkable about it at first glance. Yet, driven by an insatiable curiosity, he employed his insight. Suddenly, the door transformed before his eyes, revealing a maelstrom of chaotic symbols that assaulted his mind. Staggering back, John gasped for air, overwhelmed by the door's hidden complexities. You've glimpsed the true nature of the gate of things. Impressive, Alchemist Zero remarked with a nod of approval. Go forth, for what lies beyond is your reward. Be it magic, wealth, or power, it can all be yours. His words were enticing, yet John, with a penetrating gaze, asked, and the price. Alchemist Zero was momentarily taken aback by the question. Ah, you are astute. Many forget to ask. The price, it varies. It could be a limb, your sight, perhaps even your very soul. As he mentioned the soul, a sly smile crept across Alchemist Zero's face. But such things seem trivial to someone of your caliber. The gate of things offers rewards beyond even the sorcerer's stone. Few would resist its call. John stood silent, contemplating the door. The gate of things represented the zenith of alchemical achievement, capable of granting any desire at a cost. An equivalent exchange was demanded, a fundamental principle of alchemy that John was all too familiar with. His thoughts drifted to his primary goal, a way back. The gate of things might offer a solution, but at what cost? As he approached the door, Alchemist Zero's eyes gleamed with a mocking sneer. Pausing, John turned, The highest reward for an alchemist, you say? Indeed, Alchemist Zero replied, confident. Yet, John's next words caught him off guard. Have you ever encountered Nicholas Flamel? The mention of the name startled Alchemist Zero. Seizing the moment, John's movements became a blur as he lunged forward, his wand reversing in his grip. Alchemist Zero barely had time to react before a sharp crack echoed, and the wand's tip pierced through him like a venomous strike. As Alchemist Zero collapsed, disbelief and rage contorted his features. Do you realize what you've done? He gasped, clutching at his neck, his voice a raspy whisper. John's response was cold, laced with disdain. Did you forget our encounter outside this realm? With a flick of his wand, a drop of inky black substance fell to the ground, not blood, but something far darker. Before being drawn into this strange space, John had glimpsed a face marked by a curse, a face belonging to Extus, the creator of the Dementors. This encounter was no coincidence, and John knew that magic in this realm was beyond his reach. Yet, this realization brought him a sense of peace. In a place where magic was nullified, John found an odd sense of sanctuary. Nicholas Flamel refined the art of alchemy beyond what many thought possible. John mused, his thoughts turning to the legendary alchemist. But even he understood the importance of balance and the dangers of seeking power without considering the cost. As Alchemist Zero lay defeated, John's resolve hardened. He knew the path ahead would be fraught with peril, but the encounter had reaffirmed a crucial lesson. The greatest power lies not in what one can take, but in what one can resist. The Philosopher's Stone is undoubtedly the pinnacle of alchemy, and its creator, Nicholas Flamel, 
is hailed as the greatest alchemist of all time. It was almost laughable to think he would be present here. John's face twisted into a smirk, clearly doubting the credibility of Extus's claim. It seemed impossible to him that Nicholas Flamel could still be alive, which explained Extus's shock upon hearing Flamel's name mentioned. Caught in his deception, Extus's expression darkened momentarily before he let out a mocking laugh. John Wick, it is thanks to you that I found my way here, and it is also thanks to you that I have been awakened once more, Extus declared, his arms unraveling like cocoons, with black silk threads draping from his body. He raised an eyebrow, a sarcastic smile playing on his lips. As a token of my gratitude, I shall turn yo, you into my newest masterpiece. There's no need for that, John retorted with a sneer, his grip on his wand tightening. He thought to himself how this old trickster had masqueraded as an NPC to deceive him into unlocking the door. Let's see if I can put an end to your schemes. Chapter 167 Extus and the Sacrifice Extus possesses the ability to use curses because he himself is a manifestation of a curse, albeit with his powers limited to controlling the physical body. Although he was dead, a combination of a curse left on a Dementor and the manipulation of a Time-Turner allowed him to regain consciousness. Initially, John was puzzled by Extus's penchant for torturing people to create Dementors, viewing it as a form of pure evil that benefits only the perpetrator, akin to a neurosis. However, he soon realizes that there's a method to this madness, a twisted logic that led to the accidental creation of an immortal Extus. By escaping this confined space, Extus would achieve complete eternal life, a bargain that made John laugh incredulously. Indeed, John couldn't contain his amusement. Incredible, he said, covering his face as his laughter grew louder, port a greedy glint visible between his fingers. Even Extus was taken aback by this reaction. It seems you're quite confident, Extus remarked, unable to tolerate such a demeanor. He was accustomed to being the one in control, and yet, here was John, looking at him as if he were merely an object, asking coldly, What are you laughing at? Me? I'm just thinking of something amusing, John replied, struggling to suppress a smile. You want me to open the door of things and use it to return to the world. Extus, realizing his plan was seen through, laughed maniacally. You know, it doesn't matter. I will be the one to send you in. No, 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 John quickly interjected, still smiling. What if I told you I was planning to do the same? A mirror floated between them, and in the blink of an eye, John vanished. Extus, caught off guard by the absence of any magical disturbance, was left bewildered. Then a whisper reached his ears. Tell me, how valuable is a person who has lived for hundreds of years? In frustration, Extus destroyed a mirror, only to find it empty. Get me out, he demanded, his white feathers turning ominously black. He unleashed a flurry of curses, but John, like a specter, darted between the mirrors, evading capture. When Extus paused, John seized the moment. A silver hand swiftly covered Extus's mouth and nose, and before he could react, a wand pierced his neck. Such a wound would be lethal to a mortal, but Extus, being a cursed entity, was shocked. His body exploded into a black tide, attempting to engulf John, who merely touched a mirror and reappeared behind another. Extus reformed, staring at John with pink eyes filled with disbelief. John, twirling his wand with ease, taunted, Wizards without magic, did you think you were powerless? You relied on me to enter this place. It seems you haven't changed since your living days. John remarked, his laughter igniting Extus's fury. When the two taboos meet, the door of things will reveal the path to the ultimate, Extus declared solemnly. Beyond the door lie the regrets and desires that can be fulfilled. John had an epiphany. No wonder you create Dementors. He realized that Dementors were part of Extus's alternative study of souls, aiming to gather enough pure souls to open the door of things. However, failing to achieve this in life, Extus settled for using the Dementors themselves. John saw Dementors as soul purifiers, and indeed they were. But Extus's plan was foiled upon meeting John, who was not only a master of magic but also cunning and resourceful. Extus launched another attack, but John effortlessly dodged and vanished behind a mirror once more. Frustrated, Extus shattered mirror after mirror, never catching John. Suddenly, a powerful force struck Extus from behind, propelling him forward. He tumbled towards the door of things, and as he looked up, he saw John opening the door. With a smile, 
John addressed the gate of things, proposing a trade based on the unique combination of soul and curse that Extus represented. The gate of things, akin to the curse of coins, operates on a system of exchange, though instead of currency, it deals in a broader spee, key trum of offerings. Given the centuries of curses imbued within Extus, John's own value seemed lesser in comparison. Yet, as he made his request, a shadowy arm emerged from the gate, swiftly capturing Extus, who attempted to flee. More arms followed, ensnaring him and pulling him into the abyss. Clinging desperately to the doorframe, Extus's eyes darkened from pink to black as he glared at John, his voice filled with hatred and despair. No, I won't let you go. His roar was akin to that of a beast caught in a trap, losing all semblance of composure. John approached calmly, methodically prying Extus's fingers from the frame. Rest assured, I will make good use of the opportunity you've provided, John assured him. With a final swift motion, he freed the last of Extus's grip, and the door slammed shut, leaving behind an intricate design of lines and circles. Upon reopening, the door revealed a stark white space, housing three distinct gates, one white, symbolizing life and death, a golden one, representing the past and future, and a silver gate of creation. Knowledge of these doors flooded John's mind upon entry, accompanied by a system notification offering a unique blessing based on his choice. Faced with the Golden Gate, John contemplated the possibility of opening all three, a thought that was quickly dismissed upon noticing a warning inscribed on the Silver Gate against greed and selfishness. Shaken, he approached the Golden Gate, intent on returning to his own time. However, a feeling of being watched halted him. Turning, he saw an elderly man, smiling benevolently as he held his wife's hand. As John stepped through the Golden Gate, a sword flew past him, eliciting a pleased nod from the old man. John awoke under a starlit sky. The events of the day, encounters with Dementors, a surge of curses, interactions with Shim and Extus, and the revelation of the Gate of Things, weighing heavily on him. He lit his wand, its glow a comforting reminder of his return to his world. After a moment of reflection by the lake, now deserted by the Dementors and absent of the two Harrys, John prepared to leave. A glimpse of a sword, half-submerged in the lake and emitting a sinister light, caught his eye. Teacher, he whispered, recalling the image of Nicole Flamel within the Gate of Things. The day's experiences, especially the encounter with his teacher and the profound implications of the gates, lingered in his mind as he contemplated his next steps in this familiar yet forever changed world. John approached the spot where the sword had been discarded, his heart racing with anticipation. With a steady hand, he reached out and grasped the hilt of the Sword of Silver Wick. To his astonishment, the once-destroyed blade had been miraculously restored. But it was not just the physical restoration that caught John's attention. A familiar yet peculiar sensation coursed through him as he touched the sword. Running his fingers along the blade, he felt an inexplicable joy emanating from the Sword of Silver Wick, as if it were alive and rejoicing in its renewal. A realization dawned on John, causing his eyes to widen in awe. Equivalent exchange, he murmured to himself, sacrifice a soul and in return, gain a soul. The notion was chilling yet fascinating. Truly, this is a testament to the ingenuity of the most nefarious wizard in history. It's a bargain well made, John thought, a hint of admiration laced with a dark amusement in his thoughts. At that moment, a notification chimed in his mind. Ding, task completed. Choose your reward, plus one task point or receive the blessing, Backtracker. Backtracker allows you to trace back the events that occurred in a specific scene and recover items involved. John's eyes widened in disbelief at the description of the blessing. This ability seems almost too powerful, he thought, astounded by the potential it held. As he turned, his gaze fell upon a pair of small, frightened eyes. It took him a moment to recognize the owner of those eyes, Peter Pettigrew, the very person he had been ta sked to capture. Pettigrew looked utterly panicked, regretting his decision to venture to this place, lured by the mysterious golden light in the lake. John's discovery of the Sword of Silver Wick and the subsequent encounter with Pettigrew set the stage for a confrontation that neither of them had anticipated. The implications of the sword's restoration and John's new ability hinted at a deeper, more complex web of events about to unfold. Chapter 168 The Silver-Handed Visitor 
and the furious interim minister. With only ten minutes left before Dumbledore's deadline, Hermione and Harry hastened their steps. Time was against them. As they reached the castle's gate, they saw the executioner on his way to summon the Dementors. It was already too late. However, a glimmer of hope appeared when they spotted Buckbeak descending with a ferret in its beak. Harry's eyes sparkled with an idea, and he quickly motioned for Hermione to join him. Together, they mounted Buckbeak and soared up to the eighth floor, where they spotted Sirius through a window. The sight filled Harry with an overwhelming sense of surprise and urgency. But there was an unexpected twist. Standing at Sirius's door was none other than the Minister of Magic, Rufus Scrimger, his demeanor oozing pride. We've been searching for you for quite some time, he announced, expecting Sirius to understand the gravity of his presence. Sirius, however, remained silent, unfazed by Scrimger's attempts at intimidation. To Scrimger, capturing Sirius was a victory that would solidify his position and pave his way to becoming the official Minister of Magic. He believed that even Johnny Silverhand would have to curb his arrogance in the face of such power. Scrimger's relationship with Johnny Silverhand had evolved over time. Initially, as head of the Auror office, he found Silverhand to be a valuable ally. However, upon ascending to the ministerial role, Silverhand's influence became a thorn in Scrimger's side, especially after Silverhand played a role in Fudge's downfall. This made Silverhand an even greater threat in Scrimger's eyes. If you're willing to disclose the identity of the person who aided your escape from Azkaban, I can assure you a less grim fate, Scrimger proposed, implying that Sirius could avoid the Dementor's kiss by betraying Silverhand. Sirius, however, scoffed at the offer, unmoved by the minister's coercion. Harry and Hermione realized they had no chance to intervene as long as Scrimger remained. Time was slipping away when suddenly the executioner returned, whispering urgent news that visibly shook Scrimgeour, prompting him to leave in haste. Seizing the moment, Hermione and Harry descended on Buckbeak. In her urgency, Hermione bypassed the use of a simple unlocking spell and instead blasted the door lock open with an explosive spell, a move that even took Sirius by surprise. Without lingering for pleasantries, they helped Sirius escape on Buckbeak, then dashed through the castle with unprecedented speed. With less than five minutes to spare, they overheard Scrimger inquiring about Johnny Silverhand's presence at Hogwarts. Dodging peeves and avoiding further delays, they made it back just as Dumbledore was closing the infirmary door. Dumbledore, with a knowing smile, greeted them. How did it go? It's done, they replied, both visibly exhausted and leaning on each other for support. Dumbledore, understanding the gravity of their night, offered them refuge in the infirmary to rest and create an alibi for their daring rescue. As Hermione and Harry settled in, Dumbledore's departure was hastened by an urgent whisper from Hermione about John. Dumbledore, with a gentle reassurance, promised he was aware of the situation and urged them to rest. Minutes later, a distant roar echoed through the castle. The interim minister of magic, known for his iron resolve, was furiously reacting to more than just Sirius's escape. Harry and Hermione exchanged puzzled looks, wondering if the uproar was solely about Sirius or if there were deeper layers to the minister's fury. Upon meeting Sir Johnny Silverhand, Dumbledore was greeted by a figure whose wisdom shone through the lenses of his half-moon glasses. Standing before him, adorned in a silver mask and draped in a green robe, Lord Silverhand's voice was low and hoarse as he shook hands with Dumbledore. Before Dumbledore's arrival, Rufus Scrimger was already present, wearing a sour expression, likely due to some unpleasant exchange, E with Silverhand. Excuse me, I must attend to Sirius, who is due for sanctions, Scrimger said, casting a dark glance at Silverhand before departing with the executioner and Snape, leaving only Dumbledore and Silverhand in the room. Johnny Silverhand sighed lightly, and broached the subject of the Triwizard Tournament. Principal Dumbledore, I've heard rumors of Hogwarts' intention to revive the Triwizard Tournament. I am prepared to offer a substantial sum as a prize, he proposed. Dumbledore, maintaining his composure, expressed curiosity about how Silverhand had come by such confidential information, given that the plan was still under wraps and known to only a few. And how, may I ask, does His Excellency Johnny Silverhand intend to sponsor us? 
Dumbledore inquired calmly. I've dedicated myself to nurturing young wizards, and this presents an excellent opportunity to promote that cause. If you're agreeable, I'm willing to contribute 5,000 galleons as the prize, Silverhand revealed, an amount that significantly exceeded the original prize of 1,000 galleons. Dumbledore pondered the offer, especially when Silverhand added that his store would also donate a set of Zed series products and cover their maintenance. The Zed series, highly sought after even among Aurors, was comparable in value to the Galleon Prize, with the added benefit of maintenance, which would be a boon for the students who received it. After some consideration, Dumbledore accepted the generous offer. However, their discussion was interrupted by Scrimger's return, who, with a face darkened by rage, accused Silverhand of aiding Sirius's escape. It's you, isn't it, Johnny Silverhand? He bellowed. Silverhand responded coolly, denying any involvement and pointing out that he had not left the room since his arrival. Scrimger, frustrated and unable to prove his accusations, eventually stormed off to the school hospital, where Dumbledore had already prepared a defense. Harry Potter, skillfully feigning ignorance, was quickly dismissed by Scrimger, who left in a huff with his Aurors to continue their search. The situation escalated when the Daily Prophet sought an interview, but Scrimger, humiliated, chose to leave the scene. Silverhand, too, made his exit, but not before casting a curious glance at Harry and inquiring if he was the famed Harry Potter. Harry, caught off guard, was unable to respond before Silverhand shook his head and departed, muttering to himself about Harry's appearance. Silverhand's departure was as mysterious as his arrival, leaving in a carriage pulled by three flying horses. Once inside, he removed his silver mask, revealing the face of a mature man, and expressed his reluctance to continue such tasks to the young boy opposite him. John smiled as he asked, How does it feel to face Dumbledore? Tang me grimaced. It's dreadful. My instincts as an Auror scream that he's incredibly dangerous. It's as if I can't hide any secrets from him. I feel the same, John chuckled, stepping out of the carriage as soon as they were beyond Hogwarts' boundaries. Barty Crouch is someone worth forming a deep bond with. He extended his kindness to us first, and we shall reciprocate. We've secured the sponsorship for the Triwizard Tournament. Let's have Rita spread the word effectively. As for our acting minister, John's voice trailed off as his gaze landed on a dead mouse in a cage. He spoke with a hint of significance. I hope he appreciates this gift. Understanding dawned on Tang Mi. She nodded, closed the carriage door, and guided the Pegasus away. John made his way back to the castle from the shrieking shack, pondering the events that had unfolded. Chapter 169 The Gathering of the Star Club In the secret chamber of the Star Society, John took a leisurely bite of an apple before placing it on the table. Extending his left hand, a golden magic ring materialized, its design reminiscent of a tree branch, similar to those seen on the Gate of Things. He slipped the ring onto the apple, and with a slight twist, the portion he had bitten off regrew, seamlessly filling the gap. It's fascinating, looking back. John mused, acknowledging that using the ring required the consumption of golden sand within his body. A single use would deplete half of his reserves, limiting him to a maximum of two uses per day. However, the golden sand would regenerate from the golden imprint by the next day. This ability, if wielded wisely, could be incredibly powerful. Turning his attention to his right hand, John observed the black mark that radiated a sinister aura. As he opened his palm, black silk threads emerged from his fingers, encircling the apple. In moments, the apple withered rapidly, eventually disintegrating into powder. This new version of the Soul Eater curse lacked ecstasy's consciousness but was equally potent. Golden hours, black souls, John reflected, contemplating the dual nature of the magic inscribed within him. He then stored away the remnants of the Soul Eater curse. On the table lay an exquisitely crafted hourglass, its top marred by a gap that had allowed all the sand to escape. A device capable of manipulating time entrusted to a student by Dumbledore? John pondered, suspecting that the multiple appearances of Hermione he had witnessed were due to this very device. His thoughts darkened with a hint of dissatisfaction towards Dumbledore's apparent lack of trust in him. John considered repairing the hourglass using his retrospective ability, 
thereby gaining a device capable of time manipulation. However, he realized the importance of informing Dumbledore about the hourglass's damage to avoid any potential conflicts over its possession. As he contemplated, members of the Star Club began to arrive, taking their seats around the round table without disturbing John. Heinrich sat to John's left, with Daphne beside him, while the seat to John's right remained vacant until Percy, who arrived late, took it. The seating arrangement subtly reflected the members' perceived status within the group. Percy, apologizing for his tardiness due to his responsibilities as the student council president, noticed the hourglass and expressed surprise. A time-turner? he inquired. John, surprised by Percy's knowledge, learned that every student who took twelve courses had the opportunity to receive a time-turner, applied for by Professor Dumbledore. This revelation darkened John's mood, as he felt overlooked despite his achievements. Taking a deep breath to quell his dissatisfaction, John addressed the gathered members with a smile. I'm delighted to see everyone here in the Star Club. This year has brought us closer together through various challenges. He turned to Neville, expressing his pleasure at Neville's self-discipline and remarkable transformation, setting a positive tone for the meeting. John observed Neville, who had undergone a remarkable transformation, resembling more a gym coach than the boy he once was. Neville's physical prowess was undeniable, his arm muscles bulging impressively. Had it not been for his familiar face, John might have struggled to recognize him. With your current progress, Neville, you're not far from becoming a formidable boxer, capable of taking on Death Eaters in hand-to-hand -hand combat, John remarked, half-jokingly. Neville, slightly embarrassed by the praise, scratched his head and smiled sheepishly. Turning his attention to Cedric, John noted the young man's unique charm, distinct from the typical Slytherin or Gryffindor demeanor. Even Heinrich, usually hard to impress, held Cedric in high regard. John felt a sense of pride in his ability to bring such diverse talents together. Malfoy, on the other hand, presented a contrast of appearance, says. Clothed, he seemed slender, but without his robes, his physique revealed a surprising strength, underscored by well-defined muscles. Daphne, known for her academic excellence and mastery of spells, unfortunately lacked culinary skills, a minor flaw in her otherwise impeccable persona. Heinrich stood as John's closest rival in terms of strength, while Percy, poised to become Barty Crouch's assistant at the Ministry of Magic, was earmarked by John for a significant role in their future endeavors. The formation of their group, the Stars Club, was beginning to bear fruit, a development that filled John with satisfaction. To commemorate their achievements, a golden cup was produced, from which a golden, mellow liquid was served. The starlight from the dome above lent an ethereal glow to the scene. To the Stars Club, John toasted, raising his glass. The others followed suit, though Percy hesitated, torn between the joy of the moment and the adherence to school rules. Ultimately, the unique aroma of the wine, far removed from the mundane pumpkin juice, swayed his decision. The wine's effects were immediate and varied. Neville's face flushed with warmth. Malfoy's laughter ended with an ungraceful tumble and Daphne's usual poise gave way to giggles. Cedric and Percy exchanged looks of surprise, noting the wine's unusual properties, which seemed to enhance their magical power slightly. This wine deserves a name. How about Kun Xing? John suggested, unaffected by the drink due to his unique constitution. The wine, a byproduct of their collective magical surplus, was indeed special. As the evening progressed, Cedric tended to Neville, Heinrich managed Malfoy with ease, and Daphne's laughter filled the room. John then presented Percy with a spell-imbued ring, signifying his upcoming role with Barty Crouch. Percy's curiosity about John's involvement with the International Magic Exchange and Cooperation Department led to a revealing conversation. John hinted at deeper machinations at play, promising Percy a glimpse of his true capabilities. John took the opportunity to address Percy's demeanor, encouraging him to stand tall and proud. Humility is commendable, but it should not come at the cost of obscuring your talents, John advised. He observed Percy's habitual slouch, a physical manifestation of his deference to authority, and urged him to embrace his worth as a member of the Stars Club. The gathering, marked by camaraderie, revelations, and a shared vision for the future, underscored the diverse strengths and potential of the Stars Club members.
As they navigated their individual paths, the bonds forged that night promised to shape not only their destinies, but also the broader magical world. The festivities of the Club of Stars stretched into the evening, and even the usually strict Percy couldn't dampen the spirits. The group indulged in just a glass of wine each, yet the excitement was palpable. As the night wore on, Neville and Malfoy found themselves at odds, the root of their dispute being Malfoy's refusal to acknowledge that Neville's arm strength was superior. The argument escalated into a physical altercation, with both wizards choosing to forego the use of their wands in a mutual understanding. The skirmish concluded with Neville triumphantly seated atop Malfoy, declaring his victory. Both participants were inebriated by the time they returned to their respective dormitories, leaving their housemates bewildered and curious about the night's events. In Gryffindor, rumors quickly circulated that Neville had ventured out to confront a troll and had emerged victorious, leaving the creature battered and bruised. Such a tale, if told during their first year, would have been met with laughter and disbelief. However, having witnessed Neville's impressive display of strength earlier that evening, the rumor didn't seem so far-fetched. Meanwhile, the gossip within Slytherin took a more fantastical turn, with whispers suggesting that Malfoy had spent the night with a banshee. The originator of this ludicrous claim soon found themselves the target of the entire house's ire, particularly the Malfoys. The absurdity of the rumors in both houses highlighted the wild nature of the evening's events, leaving a lasting impression on all who heard them. Chapter 170 Lupin's Guess and Hermione's Apology After John returned, he scarcely left the confines of the Stars Club. Whenever someone sought him out, he was nowhere to be found. He confidently skipped the remainder of his classes, likely the only student to do so with such audacity. This behavior infuriated Snape to no end. Upon encountering John, Snape's expression soured considerably. Mr. Wick, if your mind isn't entirely consumed by thoughts of pumpkin juice, then perhaps you'll recall what you've neglected, Snape remarked with a smug tone. John had grown accustomed to Snape's demeanor, viewing him as a rather peculiar figure. After a moment's thought, he realized he had overlooked a task. A werewolf, he inquired. Snape's faint look of acknowledgement confirmed John's suspicion. Despite knowing the truth, Snape was displeased with Lupin's appointment as a professor. John contemplated whether he should personally address the recurring issue of the defense against the dark arts position. Snape's attitude revealed his disdain for Gryffindor's perceived heroism, which he found hypocritical and repulsive. I understand, John nodded, turning to leave. However, Snape halted him. John Wick, you've left your belongings behind. Following Snape's prompt, John noticed the badge on the table. With a subtle glint in his eye, he smiled and said, I almost forgot. He pocketed the badge and exited, his expression neutral. John had intentionally left the badge to gauge Snape's reaction, which clearly indicated Snape's desire to distance himself from John. The Stars Club isn't appealing to you? John mused, slightly disappointed. Snape's alliance could have simplified many matters, but it was evident that Snape remained aligned with Dumbledore's faction. Regaining his composure, John proceeded to the defense against the Dark Arts office. Upon knocking, he heard Lupin's voice inviting him in. Inside, John found Lupin grading papers. Lupin's gaze hardened upon seeing John, who sat down and remarked, Professor, you seem quite wary of me. Lupin's suspicion had evolved into a firm hypothesis. Setting aside his quill, he looked at John intently and said, John, you are Johnny Silverhand. John was taken aback. Had his secret identity been compromised? The person, he managed to say, his brief hesitation confirming Lupin's suspicion. Lupin sighed. I knew it. From our first encounter, I sensed something different about you. He recalled his experiences at Johnny Silverhand's store, cautioning John, that man is dangerous. Immersing yourself in his world and idolizing him will only lead you astray. Idolizing? Astray? John pondered the irony of admiring himself. Lupin, mistaking John's silence for contemplation, wore a pained expression. He had observed John emulating Johnny Silverhand's mannerisms, concluding that John held the man in high regard. If I hadn't witnessed that harrowing scene, perhaps I too might have idolized Johnny Silverhand, the mastermind behind it all. But there are no ifs in life. 
Delving into soul manipulation is a forbidden art, even for Johnny Silverhand, Lupin advised. Realizing Lupin mistook him for a mere admirer of Johnny Silverhand, John seized the opportunity to shift the conversation. With feigned embarrassment, he confessed, You're a werewolf, Professor. Lupin, anticipating John's direction, replied, I'm aware that my condition is a result of Johnny Silverhand's intervention. I respect him, but I cannot condone his actions. A werewolf becoming a professor, don't you think that's all thanks to him? John pressed, challenging Lupin's stance. Lupin acknowledged the truth without hesitation. Having faced discrimination himself, he understood the significance of equality and the impact of Johnny Silverhand's actions on his life. With a complex expression, John admitted, I accept all of this, so I will not continue as a professor. Truthfully, I don't wish to stay any longer, even though Professor Dumbledore has offered me the opportunity to do so. Lupin sighed deeply, his gay, as he fixed on his most talented student. John, he said earnestly, I truly hope you don't end up like him. I won't, John replied, his voice firm. Yet, inwardly, he mused, because I am him. Despite his internal conflict, John's serious demeanor reassured Lupin, who then proceeded to announce John's grades, a perfect score, as expected. Exiting the room, John noticed the orderly space and realized Lupin had been truthful. However, Lupin's comparison of him to Johnny Silverhand left John feeling disheartened. I'm genuinely trying to do good for the magical world, he thought defensively. Given Lupin's stance, it seemed unlikely that John would revisit the Johnny Silverhand store, a prospect he regretfully abandoned. Upon entering the auditorium, John was immediately pulled aside by Hermione. Assuming she wanted the time-turner back, he presented the shattered device, apologizing. Sorry, this is broken. I want to say sorry to you, John. Hermione spoke simultaneously, causing a moment of stunned silence between them. Quickly realizing the situation, Hermione dismissed the concern over the time-turner, promising to explain its accidental breakage to the professor. Then, with a guilty look, she confessed. I'm sorry, John. I doubted you. Confused, John couldn't recall any instance that might have led to her suspicion. Yet Hermione felt compelled to apologize, believing it a grave insult to doubt a friend, even silently. I thought you might have given Sirius Black the password to the Gryffindor Lounge, she admitted, her anxiety about potentially losing a friend evident. John remained silent, absorbing her words. Hermione's nervousness grew, fearing his anger. However, John's response was a gentle chuckle. Hermione, I accept your apology, he said sincerely, relieving her immediate worry. Perhaps it's because I'm surrounded by too many secrets, making it hard for me to be completely open with others, John reflected, acknowledging the distance growing between him and his first friend at Hogwarts. Despite spending less time together, their friendship had endured. But, Hermione, I would never harm a friend, he assured her earnestly, reinforcing her trust. Choosing not to probe into the dangerous events by the lake, Hermione respected John's privacy. They then agreed to explain the broken time-turner to Dumbledore together. Wearing an extra long sleeve under his robe to conceal his healed hand, John felt a twinge of nervousness as they approached the headmaster's office. After ascending the spiral staircase, they were greeted by the familiar sight of the sorting hat and various peculiar silver instruments. However, John's attention was immediately drawn to the Elder Wand resting on the table, causing a sharp intake of breath. Inside, the benevolent, silver-haired Dumbledore didn't seem surprised by their visit. Miss Granger, Mr. Wick, he greeted, indicating two chairs prepared for them. As John sat down, he locked eyes with Dumbledore, his occlumency shields instinctively rising. I'm sorry, Professor. I broke the time-turner, he confessed, bracing himself for the conversation ahead. Hermione was the first to speak, her voice carrying the weight of her courage. It's all because of my foolishness, she declared, her tone heavy with guilt. Dumbledore, however, responded with a surprising calmness. With a gentle shake of his head and a smile, he reassured her. Miss Granger, everything that exists is bound to break eventually. I'm just relieved that its destruction didn't cause you any harm. In that moment, Dumbledore exuded the warmth of a kindly grandfather. His attention then shifted to John. Mr. Wick, I'm grateful you've accompanied Hermione here, Dumbledore said, his voice tinged with gratitude. After a brief pause, his expression grew more serious. 
I'll take the responsibility of explaining everything to the Ministry of Magic, though it might take some time. The interim minister is currently facing difficulties. John remained stoic, focusing inwardly, as Hermione's curiosity peaked. What is happening at the Ministry of Magic? she inquired. Dumbledore offered a knowing smile. I suspect today's edition of the Daily Prophet will shed light on a grave injustice, a wrongful conviction from twelve years ago. His hint was not lost on Hermione, a bright and perceptive witch. The realization struck her, and she immediately thought of Sirius. Unable to contain her urgency, she quickly stood up to take her leave. John was also preparing to depart when Dumbledore halted him with a request. John, I hope you can let go of certain things. The path of magic isn't always just, Dumbledore advised, his voice taking on a tone of solemnity and mild reproof. John paused, a look of confusion crossing his face. Professor Dumbledore, was the time-turner the only thing you requested? He asked, seeking clarification. Without waiting for an answer, John swiftly exited the room. Dumbledore, left alone, Nogra opened a drawer to reveal the time-turner, still intact. Despite the object's unharmed state, he sighed, a gesture of deep contemplation and unresolved concerns.